As we progress in our studies of macronutrients, I want to introduce you to LEA. And as you see above, LEA is low energy availability. It kind of does what it says on the tin, really. But I just want to express exactly what we mean by this. So if I was to take the latter two letters of this, energy availability to any person, you would not be surprised to know, would equal our energy... I'll actually write... I should have done this all in symbols, but I'll go for energy intake, which I'm going to call from now EI... So it equals our energy intake minus, and this is where we're going to get exercise energy expenditure, energy expenditure. And of course, we call this EEE. -E -E. So let's just step back from that and make sure we understand what that's telling us, EEE. -E -E. So we are effectively saying that the energy that is available to person, energy availability, is a sum of the energy we take in through macronutrient minus anything we spend in terms of movement. So think about sort of a sports person. This is going to be pretty high, right? So presumably, this is going up in conjunction. So what would cause the low bit of this? Well, it would be when en exercise and energy expenditure was high, but this wasn't happening. And that's the way I want you to think about this. And that's in many ways going to frame what we're about to discuss and the, t and the types of people this might affect. So when does it occur? It occurs when, okay, and this is kind of our summary. It occurs when we've got low EI, low energy intake, and it has to occur also, uh, and this is insufficient in relation to exercise energy expenditure. So this relationship is insufficient, Okay, it's insufficient. We are not taking enough energy to power that exercise energy expenditure. And as a result of this, folks, and this is where things get a little bit serious and potentially a bit grotty, what we're saying here is that fish. Bear with me a second. What we're saying here is that physiological functions, physiological functions, they can suffer as a result of this. And what we would summarize that as, and we're going to get into the details of this, this would this would prevent, it prevents optimal health. So with that in mind, folks, we want to start to understand what are the risk factors to this LEA? What might be the causation of this? So let's just have a look at risk factors. What might be the precursors, the antecedents of this risk factors? And they're fairly obvious, really. But here's the first one. What about down arrow decreased dietary intake? Someone who is on a diet, for example, but is exercising heavily may experience this. Secondly, if we get an increase in exercise energy expenditure, you know, we start going to the gym five times a week, six times a week, seven times a week, and we haven't been going. That is not what we would call progressive overload. We're not doing it gradually and steadily. We're doing it all at once. And that is going to cause this energy deficiency to actually take place. Someone who has a desire for weight loss, this would be a classic case. You know, someone who's you know effectively gone on to a diet, is on that diet for a period of time, and then ups their exercise quantity quite drastically, that sort of desire for weight loss, that combination is going to be something that it's, 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 got, it's going to predict for this. And we'd also say this is quite common in, let's summarize it as disordered eating. You know, someone who's experiencing eating disorder type conditions might be more likely uh, to experience this. And finally, there are a subcategory of people who might experience this due to changes in hunger hormones. Now, I don't know if you know much about hunger hormones. It's sort of beyond the scope of this particular course. But we're talking about the relationship of two pivotal hormones. The first one called ghrelin. It's a bit of a funny spelling in there. There's a little R in there. Ghrelin and leptin okay and these two hormones regulate hunger or regulate for hunger so if, if if there's a an unbalance in those hormones that can then cause this uh, this tendency in other words we might start taking on less food because maybe hunger is affected and all of this folks is leading to this and this is where i think there's really interesting stuff to consider all of this can cause what we call relative relative deficiency relative deficiency uh sorry relative energy deficiency 
in sport. Now, if we take our R, our E, our D and our S, what that produces for us is a condition called REDS. Okay, and I'm going to just quickly describe what this is to you. And I'm going to say some slightly provocative things as we go through this. So what we've got is we've got a combination of two things. And this is over time, by the way, so relatively chronic. We have got low EI energy intake. We've already talked about that. We've also got high EEE -E -E in a person over time. Secondly, folks, secondly, we are talking here about an individual who may be female because this condition is very common in specifically young female athletes. Okay, now let's step back from that a second. What would be the drivers, young and female? So we are taking on little food or not enough and we're exercising. Well, well the athlete bit sort of caters for the lots of exercise, right? But why might females be more likely to experience this low energy intake? Is it to do with the types of sports, let's say gymnastics, for example, that uh, perhaps females are more commonly involved in? Is this to do with body image? Is this to do with societal views of what women should look like? Now, I'm not going to try and answer those questions, but I'm just going to pose them as considerations for you within this particular topic. And I want to introduce you to what we call the triad effect. That's the triad effect. Now, there's three classic symptoms of this condition. The first one, and I want you to think about this, let's say for a young female uh, gymnast at high level, they might experience bone deficiency, energy deficiency, you know, by definition, that's what we're talking about here. So lack of bone strength, lack of energy, and they might experience what we call menstrual dysfunction. Now this has different definitions of menstrual dysfunction, but in some cases this can be the complete non-starting of the menstrual cycle until much later in adolescence potentially. So we've got menstrual dysfunction, bone deficiency, and energy deficiency. Take these two alone and think about a high level gymnast doing lots and lots of reps of inversions and vaults. And this is pretty dangerous stuff, right? Someone could get hurt in this situation. And I want to take the actual menstrual dysfunction aspect of this a little bit further. I just sort of want to drag this up here and give you a little bit of, uh, give you a bit of data on this. So menstrual dysfunction is estimated, get ready for this, is estimated to occur in 20% of exercising females. Okay, so let me be clear about this. We are saying that REDS is affecting the menstrual cycles of one in five females who would be considered exercising or athletic or taking part in sport and physical activity. That should be quite shocking to us. Moreover, this, moreover, this here, this here is very is virtually unknown very few coaches know about this okay so this is a real kind of like a elephant in the room if i can put it this way so with that in mind folks we really want you to be aware of um of LEA and REDS because it gives us an indication of some of the sacrifices that need to be made and also to really encourage especially young females though it could obviously apply to anyone to make sure that if we are very active which is fantastic we must make sure that we provide the relevant amount and types of good quality macronutrients to fuel our movement oh gas thank you